Well, hello and welcome to the brand new Robbie Fowler podcast in association with McDonald's McCafe. Great tasting coffee, simple. It's myself, Chris McCarty, and I'm joined by, well, the star of the show, the main man. His name is in the title, for goodness sake. It is God himself. It is the one and only Robbie Fowler. And Robbie, we're finally here, my friend. We've got this up and running. It's been, a, it's been a bit of progress, Chris, hasn't it? Hey, thankfully, we're here now, pal. That's it. We are. Let's get started. <laughs> the, the, the viewers and those listening in, they probably should know that it's taken us about two hours to get to this point, technically-wise, but we are here. And, and Rob, hang, listen... Hang, hang on. I mean, what I will say, it's, it's obviously not down to myself, though, Chris, is it? No, nothing to do hey, with I you. Mean, don't, be, don't be starting to me, make me look silly already. <laughs> No, you'll do that yourself over the course of the <laughs> next few weeks, I'm sure, Rob. But hey, listen, we are looking, well, the sun's shining at both ends. I'm in Dubai, you're in India. How is life over there? You're a manager again. I am, pal, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm obviously just, uh, there's a new club over here. I started in the I-League, uh, in the ISL League. Uh, and yeah, I'm, I'm really enjoying it, pal, to be honest. I was over in Australia, was, was relatively successful in terms of taking a team who uh, was struggling uh, and, you know, helping them qualify for the Asian Champions League. Obviously, with what happened with the virus, um, wasn't to be. Uh, ended up coming home, uh, get, getting sacked, what I shall say. Uh, I was getting, uh, I was given the al- elbow. <laughs> and then um, I was just sat at home and then just this, this just, just appeared from nowhere. And would I be interested? Obviously, you do, you do your due diligence. Um, and yeah, I just felt it was right. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a great club, you know, one of the biggest uh, and best in India. Uh, obviously, we're in the I League, but uh, had a chance to join the ISL pretty late, uh, and I've obviously I've I've come on board. Uh, we've joined the ISL, and uh, yeah, we're doing we're doing okay. You know, we we had a tough start, but um, yeah, I think the uh, certainly the last uh, three, four, five games have been uh, have been excellent. And you've got away from the kids and the wife, so it's it's win win all uh, round, really. Well, I don't think the kids or the, the missus will be happy. I think they probably will listen to this because obviously I'm in, but. I've, listen, I've got to say, I, uh, I I missed him, Chris, haven't I? Because imagine me saying, I, yeah, I'm I'm away doing something that I love, but I'm away from the family, which is uh, which is not nice, to be fair. No, fair. Uh, and listen, just to give everyone a little bit of background, we've been talking about this for a good few months now, and and you and I have have known each other for a good few years. We, we met up in Dubai, and and you're obviously a Liverpool legend. For those listening to this, don't tune off when I say this. You can probably hear it, that Mancunian accent. I'm a big Man United fan, so I don't know how we've come together on this, Rob. Uh, you know what? I don't myself, actually, because uh, I normally could, I couldn't stand people who support Man United. <laughs> so, so what <laughs> that's, is that's, it? That's, that's, that's obviously a lie. Isn't it? I'm, I'm obviously pulling pulling your leg straight away. But look, I, I know how, how passionate you are about football. And I mean, what I will say is I know you are a Man United fan, but the amount of, of love you give Liverpool, Chris, I think no is chance. incredible. And I don't, I, listen, I don't care what you say. You love Liverpool. You really do. You really do. Uh, there's nothing you can say. Any Man United fans watching or listening to this, a load of baloney that. I <laughs> am not a Liverpool fan in any way, shape or form. Well, to, to be fair though, Chris, I mean, you talk about us quite a lot though, so I'm thinking you might be. Well, I have to because you're doing all right is what you are. <laughs> a first league title in 30 years, so I've got no other choice but talk all things Liverpool in the last well, well, few months. Yeah, well, to be fair, I mean, we had enough of talking about you for years, didn't we? So I think it's better to uh, to obviously give us a little bit of love back, Chris, isn't it? Is any superstitions from you, Rob? Because, you know, I look back on my childhood, and, and again, a lot of people might be asking, how on earth does a northeast, a man from Scotland in the northeast, become a Man United fan? That's local. People will know that. That's local to be a Man United fan. But my loathing of Liverpool, and, and perhaps, did you loathe Man United growing up, Rob? Um. Loaded, load them. You know what? No, I didn't. Uh, and I mean, the best answer I can give you this is because I think when you actually tend to load something or or really dislike them, I, th- I think you have to think about them. And I actually didn't really think about them, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, when you when you when you've got your eyes on something and you and you really like something, you you know, you talk about them all the time, or you know, you want to be that person, or you want to support that team because you like them. But if there's someone you, you, you dislike, you, well, you, you tend to not watch them or, you know, you, you don't pay attention to them. So my, my focus and my aim and my goal was was just to, uh, you know, look after the teams that, that well, the team that I supported. Uh, and, and of that, course, <laughs> that was Everton <laughs> Football Club. <laughs> and that changed. <laughs> <laughs> At what point did that change when Liverpool put a contract in front of you? 
Uh, well, it was uh, a little bit before that, in all fairness. So when I was uh, Liverpool schoolboys, obviously Liverpool schoolboys, as as people are all uh, aware of, um, is obviously no affiliation to Liverpool Football Club. It's all the better kids in the area will go and play for, for the schoolboys. And when you play for the schoolboys, you get selected to go to either any Northwest club, uh, whoever has uh, the scout at the game. Um, there was obviously a few scouts at a few of the games that I was at. And the first scout that came up to me was uh, was a fella called Jim Aspinall, who's, who's sadly no longer with us. Uh, and he was adamant that he wanted me to apply my trade at Liverpool. And, you know, I, I think it's it's well documented. I was an Everton fan and uh, I think if Everton might have come first, you know, it might have been a different story. But you know, Jim was, uh, he, he was he was adamant that he wanted me to go to Liverpool. And um, as I said, with the rest of his history, I went there and never looked back. And and even when I was a little bit older, you know, I was, uh, when I say a little bit older, I was uh, 11 when I first went to the academy, uh, Liverpool Academy, which was then a centre of excellence. Uh, but when I was about 14, then then's the time you can become, um, you know, associated with that club by signing the schoolboy forms. Uh, and Everton were desperate for me. But because I'd been at Liverpool for, you know, for the three years and, you know, the training twice uh, twice a week on a Tuesday and Thursday. Uh, I just felt a lot of love at Liverpool. And I mean, I, I was just, I was changed then really. So it was obviously before all the money came into, before all the, um, you know, the, the, I don't know, the, the stick or whatever. You know, I, I was I was a Liverpool fan from, you know, maybe maybe 12 years of age, actually from, a, I, I, I sort of grew up at Liverpool. You know, that was all my, my upbringing in terms of football. And tell me this, Rob, as a fan, do you still, because, I mean, listen, I'm, what, 34 now, I'm a father, time what? is of the what? essence. You're, you're only 34? Ah, oh, yeah, cheeky bugger, cheeky <laughs> bugger. I had a tough paper round as what I had, but yes, would you believe I am only 34? But I still I still get the same buzz, watching the games, checking the results first thing in the morning, if I've missed it, whatever reason I've had to miss a game. Are you still like that? Are you still like a child when you follow Liverpool, results coming in, or because now that you're getting on in age... Are you a bit yeah, no, kind of... uh, no I, I mean, I get what you're saying, Chris. And I mean, I love the game. I love football. And I, I, I will, in fairness, watch most games. Uh, but for me, when Liverpool are playing, um, I, I mean, I will stay up and watch the games. And as you know, I'm, I'm currently in India, which is obviously five and a half hours ahead of the UK. Uh, so when Liverpool are playing, um, you know, particularly at night, I mean, it just ruins my next day. <laughs> Uh, I mean, forget about the results if they win or lose. I mean, it just ruins my next day because I'm I'm wide awake watching the games at maybe two, three o'clock in the morning, and I obviously get up and, and do stuff myself in the morning. So, uh, watching Liverpool is, is is playing havoc with my uh, my sleeping patterns in all fairness. But I mean, this is why I love not just Liverpool fans but football fans all over the world and and the, the passion and the drive and the, the commitment the, the, the dedication they show to uh, to the clubs I think it's just quite incredible it really is and I'm, I'm witnessing it myself to be honest well we've got an exciting few episodes first season of the Robbie Fowler podcast we're going to be joined by a number of special guests in, in the coming weeks today it's all about I guess introdu- introducing ourselves to our listeners and listen Rob I want to ask because You are known, this might embarrass you a little bit, but you are known as God. Where on earth do you know where that came from? Obviously, you scored bagfuls of goals for Liverpool Football Club. But is is there a story behind that? Do you attribute the nickname God to one person at the cop or or someone at the club? No, I think it was just the players. And just to go back to what you were saying, Chris, does it embarrass me? Not a chance. No, it's the best nickname in football. I don't think anyone could be embarrassed about that. Yeah, so it's... uh, I will. I'll be honest. I don't go around calling myself it much. <laughs> <laughs> to the wife. In fact, I, yeah. No, I'm. I'm. I'm very, very humble. Uh, in fact, when I die, I want uh, humble to be written on my statue, Chris. You know, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> humble and God and, and yeah. different. But uh, that's what it is. And look, I think when I um, when I went to Liverpool years ago, so I mean, it didn't obviously come straight away. But when I got into the first team. I think it was just that, you know, I had that Midas touch and everything I seemed to, to do seemed to work in my favour and sort of help the team out. So I think it might have been Neil Ruddick actually. He went, oh my God, he's like God. Oh my God, he is like God. I just said that, I can't believe he just said that. Uh, and it just stuck. And then obviously all the fans started to call me. And uh, I think you know what I love about it though, Chris, in all fairness, it is, it can be quite, um, it, quite it can be quite daunting actually, because it is probably the most, well, the, the, the best nickname anyone could ever be called. There's a lot to live up to, admittedly. Uh, but when I think of Liverpool and getting me serious there, I'm for a little bit here, but when I think about Liverpool and all the unbelievably great players they've had over the years, 
And then you've got this little uh, snotty nosed kid from you know one of the, the rougher areas in Liverpool who, who gets christened God. I mean, it's, it's, it's I find it quite unbelievable in all fairness. And uh, so to go back to what we were saying before about am I embarrassed? Not a chance. It's actually lovely to be called it. Uh, yeah, I'll take that nickname all day long. I've not got a nickname yet, so we'll maybe allow you not to yet. christen not, me not, something. Yeah, not yeah, not yeah. You will have well, some by the end uh, of these, Chris. I'll tell you. I, I, I'm sure I will. But uh, listen, I want to come back to something because uh, again, uh, I mentioned it a few minutes ago. My I don't want to say loathing of Liverpool Football Club, but my indifference to the club, being a Man United fan. And I want to tell this tale, and I want you to admit if you've got something similar. So who knows who's watching this, who's listening to this? But back in the northeast of Scotland, my little village from where I'm from there was a Liverpool fan a mate of mine by the name of Kenneth his old boy Andrew obsessive Liverpool fan every match day he'd have the flags hanging out of his windows his living room window and his bedroom window and he would go to town if Liverpool were playing everyone around town would know Andrew Adam Liverpool fan Liverpool must be playing today now growing up I didn't have Sky so my mum's a single parent didn't have Sky and Kenneth and Andrew in fairness to him would always welcome me into their house to watch a bit of the footy on Sky normally Man United are playing and then maybe a Liverpool a Super Sunday so I would head round there. But no, no one really wanted to watch Man United in those days, Chris, did they? Really? Come on now, 94, 95, everyone wanted yeah, to watch yeah, true, actually, true, Man actually, United. Yeah. All the glory oh, hunters. So, oh, oh, so that's what you are then? You've just admitted you're a glory hunter. <laughs> That's fair. I, I, can't, I can't deny it, Rob. I'm a bloody glory hunter, right? And I would pop round to his house and he was such an obsessive. On his stairs, uh, you go upstairs, it was, a, it was a two up, two down house, council house up in Scotland. And what he had was, is this, this is Anfield, the plaque as you come down the stairs. And I kid you not, that guy, anytime he went to bed, up to the restroom, coming down, he always made a point of touching it. He was one of those. And like, I, I loathed them from, from there because he was such a, he was a boorish, he was a massive Liverpool fan. And any time I would go round, he would extend an invite to me. And normally, Rob, Man United would beat Liverpool and I would be celebrating silently. He'd be throwing stuff at the television. He'd be losing his you know what. And it always stuck with me. And I do wonder, any players, do you, that this is Anfield sign, have you got that anywhere in your house? Uh, no, but I'll, I'll tell you a quick story, actually. I think when, when you do get sort of ingrained in uh, in Liverpool and uh, and I can get totally what you're saying about your friend there and I think load them just for doing something he enjoys is a bit strong in all fairness, Chris. But, <laughs> it is, I feel. Uh, it is, it is. And, and I mean, that doesn't make you a nice person. <laughs> it doesn't. It doesn't. That's on top of being a Man United fan as well. That's that's terrible. Uh, and a glory hunter. What, yeah, what I, what I did, Chris, as well, and I remember being a... Um, being a YTS player, which was obviously the equivalent of a, an apprentice years ago. So uh, I remember wanting to do everything that the first team done. And I remember one of the uh, one of my first pay packets, I actually went into town uh, and bought a ghetto blaster. Obviously, we all know what the ghetto blaster is, isn't it? I remember just walking out. I think it might have been Dixon's or Curry's and walking down the street on my shoulder, doing the aisle, you know, walk down because it was too big to carry. I remember getting home and just obviously played all music. But then... I just thought, well, I need to sort of get ingrained with, with my love of Liverpool from an early age here. So what I went and done then is I went and bought a um, a CD of uh, You'll Never Walk Alone. And I remember us playing, it was only the B team, uh, obviously the, the, the B team, the A team, reserves and the first team. So that was the uh, the levels that you had to get to before, uh, obviously to make it into uh, obviously the first team. So the B team is the under 18s. Uh, you know, we, we're playing Everton one game. And I'm thinking, I'm going to do this. So I went and got the CD, uh, woke up in the morning. And before I left the house, I went into my bedroom and I played You'll Never Walk Alone on the CD just before I left the house. <laughs> and you know what? We got B5. <laughs> I, was, I was absolutely devastated. I didn't listen to the song for a while afterwards. I'm thinking, I need to get back into this song. But I, I actually done it. I, I bought the Ghetto Blaster, I bought the CD, played You'll Never Walk Alone. And my first experience of that song was a 5 0 defeat to Everton in the B League. And I went, oh my God, what a nightmare that is. But You've got to tell I, us. I, yeah. You've I got to tell us, Rob. Were you in full kit sitting in your bedroom <laughs> listening no. to You'll Never Walk Alone? No, only, only I had my boots on, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> boots and shin pads, that was only there. <laughs> that is amazing. That is brilliant. I, so, I, that's, that's, that's the gospel truth, that as well. It's, it's, I mean, it's, 
and you lost 5 0 to Everton. I, I, you, I, actually don't, you were, I, I don't think I've ever told anyone that story, in all honesty. I, I bloody well love it, is what I do, Rob. That is belting. <laughs> Just on that then, Everton, do you keep an eye on them? Because obviously you, you once upon a time had a bit of a love affair with them. Do the, the, their results, do you keep an eye on what they're doing, the blue half? No, in all fairness, no. Um, I think when you... I mean, obviously, towards the uh, the end of all these uh, you know podcasts that we're doing, there'll be lots of stories flying about our Everton, I'm sure, anyway. But I think when you, um, when you take the amount of stick that I've had, from the Everton supporters, I think you tend to dislike them pretty quick. So uh, it's uh, yeah, I'm I'm Liverpool through and through, mate. To be fair, Liverpool are the only results I will look out for in terms of uh, and yeah, I mean to be honest, I, the, the clubs who I played for, I will look out for their results. Uh, but obviously, the, my love is Liverpool, and I, you know I'd want them to win more than anyone else. So uh, anyone else, you know, not really interested. Uh, you know, Everton growing up now. Nah. I, I want to, all, all I want my, all, actually all my family still support them actually and uh, they, they, even they don't like me <laughs> <laughs> even they don't like me you've not had a Christmas card from an uncle for about 15 uh, years honestly, 30 honestly, years yeah. well you, you can imagine Liverpool obviously everyone uh, sorry on, on one side of my family is, uh, is all blues and what, on the other side of my family are all, are all uh, reds uh, and you know even when I was um, we're playing against Everton you know I'd get phone calls from you know you know a lot of my uncles you know I hope you do well but <laughs> I hope we smash you it was, a, it was a, like a general occurrence of a phone call <laughs> I love it the, the blue half and the red half of course it is quite a friendly rivalry there's a lot of respect for, for well documented reasons that I'm sure we will touch on over the course of this first series of the Robbie Fowler podcast what I want to do though Rob and, and listen all jokes aside for a few moments because your football club and, and the footballing world as well has kind of come together in, in the last few weeks the sad passing of a man who I know played an important role in, in your career Gerard Houllier who passed away back on December the 14th. I know you were deeply affected by it. I saw some of the posts that you popped up on, on social media, Rob. Give us your kind of tribute to Gerard, who, who brought great success to the football club. I never had the, the, the privilege to, to meet Gerard myself. I've heard great things, though, about him. One of the real nice gentlemen of the game. Your own memories, Rob? Yeah, lots and lots of good ones. And, and in all fairness, Lots of bad ones, to be fair, when I was obviously, uh, you know, within the squad and, you know, I'm not playing. You know, I'll, I'll put my hand up and say, you know, I didn't like him. You know, I'm, I'm a player who wanted to play all the time. Um, and you know, when, whenever you're a manager and you're playing team, then, you know, it's, it's not a good thing. Uh, but, look, I massively respected him and, and understood much later uh, after leaving Liverpool, what he was all about and what he was what he was trying to do to me, uh, and everything that he was doing was uh, was beneficial to the club. Uh, now, you know, it was not really about individuals; it was about the team and, and what he can do for the team. Uh, and he brought a he brought a professionalism to Liverpool. You know, Liverpool. I'm not saying they were as professional as what they, they you know. Or he was. I mean, don't get me wrong. He was professional, but he could have been a little bit more professionalism uh, involved at times. Uh, and Gerard coming in sort of uh, expanded that, and you know, he made the club what it is basically today. Yeah. So yeah, a lot, lot, a lot of time for him. He's um, he's a manager who who wants to bring out the best in you. So regardless of what people think about him as, as a man you know as, as, as a man manager um, you know as, as football as football skills and his football uh, exploits were, were brilliant he was instrumental in a lot of the good Liverpool you know brought to the table now uh, the professionalism you know the, the video analysis was uh, was second to none I think what he um, his professionalism what he brought was uh, I think was seconded on so I think when uh, I was growing up it was all about what we could do as a team and you know I loved that and bear in mind every manager will have different opinions of, of going into games what they should do what they can't do uh, Gerard Houlet's uh, emphasis were look you know we're here to to stop the opposition and we're here to obviously do the job ourselves whereas in the past other managers who would just say look it's just all about us you go out there uh, you play the way you can and you'll beat teams uh, and that, that's what I always loved about Roy Evans Roy Evans they give you that belief but I think Gerard came in and his, um, his synopsis was look we need to work so much more on the opposition uh, we need to do this we need to do that uh, and we need to try and get you better in, in a large portion of uh, you know, football related businesses if you like 
Uh, and, and for me, I, I'll be honest with you, I, I took a time to adapt to that because I was old school. You know, I'd come from a from a background of watching the likes of Ian Rush, Steve Nicholl, you know, Ronnie Wheel, and all these great Liverpool players just go out and have a drink and then all of a sudden go back to training and, and win everything under the sun. But football was becoming more serious, more professional, and, and Gerard brought that in. Um, the, the video analysis, what we used to do with clubs, was was brilliant. Um, you know, sometimes me as an individual would, would go in there, and certainly no disrespect to uh, any of the clubs that we played, but would, would play Coventry, would play Middlesbrough, would play Southampton, and would would do that much analysis on their, you know, on their good play that you'd come out of the dressing room thinking that you were playing Brazil because it was <laughs> you know, this is what you've got to do to stop them, and this is why they why they do it, and it, sometimes you think. Well, Maybe we need to show us the bad bits because you know we want to capitalise on that. But he wanted to show you all the good bits and, and just get you prepared. Well, this is what can happen, uh, and it took me a while to get used to that and adapt to that. Um, and I wished I'd have got it a little bit more because um, certainly early days. Because I think what he what what he was bringing to the table was was what everyone's doing now, which is like instrumental in football, and it's, it's yeah. what I do now as as a, as a manager. You know, you you want you want what's best for your team and you try and cover every box uh, and that's what that's what he did so you went into the uh, went onto the pitch you know really knowing everything about the opposition whereas in the years gone by it was just well we just knew more more about us yeah did he have a temper rob because uh, again a lot's been made of the fact lovely gentlemen always had time for people the, uh, the the tributes that have poured in for him would back that up but did he have a temper i mean you've said that towards the end perhaps the relationship a little fractured did you have a little tete-a-tete with him yeah Anything a, you can a tell lot, us? lots of times a lot of times no furthest because i i was passionate and i wanted to play and and he believed i needed to do all the things to get better and uh you know to, to help the team and uh, to help the club and uh, as I said before Chris it was it was a case of look you know you, this is you know I'm, I'm the manager uh, you know and it's it's my way and you, you need to adapt if you want to still be at this club uh, and it, it was tough for me it really was and uh, you know I'm not proud of saying this but you know it, it took me a long long time to sort of get over that uh, but when you sort of sit back and analyse afterwards that every sort of argument that you had and every chat that you had was was not because he was a nasty man, it was because he was a good man who wanted you to be better and he wanted the team to be better. So you, you, try, and, you try and change things when, when maybe it's a bit too late. Uh, and I wished what I'd known now and, and even maybe a few years after Liverpool, I'd have known then, then you know, my career could have, could have been at Liverpool for, for, for much, much longer. Uh, I, I wished I'd have taken on board a lot, lot quicker what he was, uh, what he was educating me. Uh, and you look at the, um, I mean, you look at Steven Gerrard and you look at Cara. Uh, I mean, they were probably similar to me in terms of their upbringing and, and what they were. Uh, they were old school, maybe a little bit lighter than me in terms of, uh, you know, I was a bit older. But um, what uh, what I'm saying here is, you know, Gerrard got hold of them a lot, lot quicker. You know, and they were they were relatively new to the old uh, the old school type football, so he, he changed them quicker. And we see we see how good they became for the club, and uh, maybe I was just a little bit too too late. Maybe I was a bit too long in the tooth. But I wished I'd have um, adapted and accepted that a little bit quicker. You say you're old school. I can imagine, and I remember being a wee nipper back then. What was it, ninety five? I think it was when the the announcement came that Gerard was joining Liverpool Football Club as a co-manager. That was foreign to me at the time. There was no one at the top level that had co-managers. I mean, what must have you boys been thinking when the announcement comes that Roy's now got someone else alongside of him? Well, I mean, it was just a surreal experience. Uh, and it, it was difficult for the players because you know, we're old school and whenever there was a problem, we didn't really know who to go and see. So you can imagine <laughs> all the older players, we're, we're, we're going to see Roy Evans because He's, he's our manager so yeah so f- yeah so for a club like Liverpool to be doing that you know it, I think it's I mean I think it's quite scary and it, it is quite surreal I'm not sure whether you'd, you'd get that at Manchester United so Alex would never have accepted it um, so maybe Liverpool should have done that you just said to uh, Roy Evans look this is what's happening uh, you either you know take a backward step or you know Gerard comes in as uh, the sole manager and I think that's probably what should have happened uh, and just to give you obviously a quick story and we uh, we used to go to Norway every single year, and 
after the game in Norway, we'd uh, would have a few drinks in uh, in in a nightclub. Uh, it's a nightclub called Smoogies. I think it's no longer there. We've checked, Chris. We've checked. <laughs> We've been back and checked. It's not there. <laughs> so after this game, we'd all go there. So all the players would finish the game, and it's obviously a pre-season game. Straight back to the hotel. We changed, uh, and we're out. But this particular year, Gerard Hula and Roy Evans, joint managers, uh, and we're thinking, oh, we're out. We're out. We're anyway, after the game, we win the game pre-one. Gets on the bus. Gets back, uh, gets back on the oh, sorry, sits down on the bus. Gerard Hooley is away doing press. Uh, so Roy Evans is uh, doing press. Sorry, Gerard Hooley gets on the bus and joint managers gets on the microphone. He says, "Listen, lads," he said, "I'm a flight, flight home tomorrow." He said it in a slightly better French accent, obviously, Chris. But he went, "Listen, lads," he said, "We've got a uh, flight in the morning. Uh, everyone at home, a little bit of food uh, and straight to bed for uh, for an early rise, and we're leaving for the airport." So we're all thinking, "Not a chance. We're all going out here. You know, we're, we're going back and we're going over the wall." So anyway, Roy Evans gets on the bus, uh, bus goes back to the hotel, bus parks up, Roy Evans shoots off, gets in the hotel. Gerard Hooley gets on the mic, he said, listen lads, he said, I, I genuinely serious, uh, hotel, some food. He said, uh, straight to bed, he said, flight early tomorrow. He said, if any of you think of sneaking out, he said, you just won't play for this football club ever again. So we're thinking, oh, we'll have to really sneak out here, you know what I mean? There's, there's me and about 12 other lads at the back, we think we're really sneaking out. So anyway, Gerard Hooley goes into his uh, into his room, goes upstairs. So we're all upstairs, gets our jeans on, gets our shirt on, gets in the lift. Me and probably about 12 other players gets in the naming, lift. Goes, n- naming names, Rob, who else was culpable that uh, night? It, it, I mean, it would have been Mac, uh, Razor, Dominic, <laughs> Matteo, you know, all, all, the, uh, all, the, all the clan. It was all the clan, Chris. So anyway, we, we, we get in this uh, we get in this lift and goes downstairs. We're just about to sneak out of the back door. Uh, and uh, Gerard Hooley's waiting there. He said, "I tell you," he said, "if any of you step out of this hotel, he said, you will never play for this football club again." And just as he said that, there was a ping, and the lift doors opened, <laughs> and Roy, Roy Evans popped out and went, "Come on, boys, let's hit the town!" <laughs> and we went, "We're with him." <laughs> so you can imagine that was that was what we were dealing with as players. And, and as much as it, there's like a, a funny element to the story, and when you've got sort of one manager whose belief is. That's probably wrong. That, but one manager's look. You know, this is uh, this is what you've got to do. And the other manager will look. Let's go and uh, go on what we need to do to in terms of professionalism. Then uh, you know, it, it, it was hard. It was hard for us to take. But eventually, the uh, the the I mean, the club seen only one way, and obviously Gerard became uh, you know the sole manager. And I mean, what he did then was just I think quite quite astonishing, wasn't it? Uh, please tell us, Rob. Was it a good night? Uh, what was the name of that club again? It was Smoogies, yeah. Smoogies. Yeah, I actually don't remember if it was a good night, Chris, to be fair. (laughs) It was a bloody good night then, if that's what you're telling us. I love that. Listen, Rob, the other thing I want to do in this first episode of the new Robbie Fowler podcast, I want to debunk some myths uh, and some stories around you, Rob, because I've known you for a while, and and I've said this to you both privately, I've said it publicly on various radio shows as well. I, I think you're a bit misunderstood. I think it really takes, you know, to spend a bit of time with you, to, to really get to know Robbie Fowler. I mean, I've told you this. Growing up, I didn't know you for goodness sake, but oh, whenever I saw you, you I was like, oh, there you he is. You didn't loathe me as well, Chris, did you? Not maybe loathe, a bit strong, <laughs> but I didn't like you. I didn't like you. I thought, here he is. Because you were good. And, and invariably, against Man United, you always did pretty well against us. But getting to know you, you know, you're a football man, you know the game, and there's a few stories that I want to I wanted debunk if we can. I want to start, I'm going to take you all the way back to Highbury. I think you, you know where I'm going to go with this. I think it was uh, yeah. the 96-97 season, if memory serves me correct. Up against Arsenal... You go down, I remember it was a little through ball, David Seaman comes out, you go down, you spring back on your feet, the, the referee's given the penalty, and you're going, no, 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 it's not. It's not. Was that you saying it's not a penalty? What was the conversation there? Um, I mean, it's a funny one, because it does get brought up quite a lot, as you can imagine, you know, every year Liverpool play Arsenal, and, and this does get brought up. And I think, regardless of what people think about me, right, so people might dislike me for whatever reason, because I've scored goals or whatever, but I'm actually... I think I'm a likeable lad. I'm, I'm quite shy in all fairness. But when I'm in, when I'm in company of people who I know, then you know I'm, I'm more out of my shell. But if I'm not in a, a crowd where I'm comfortable, then you I mean you wouldn't know I'm there. You know, I, I just go out of the way. And I, uh, I'm quite pally with lots of lots of uh, you know ex-footballers because you know I'd go and speak to them and I'd like, I'd, I'd make fuss to people. 
So, I mean, with, uh, with David Seaman, uh, he was obviously a, an England teammate. And when I obviously go through, um, and he didn't touch me, and I sort of jumped over him, and, and people were, you know, maybe people thinking I was diving, but I, I think it was just a case of luck. I, I never dived. I sort of jumped over him and uh, lost my balance. And I'm one of them as well. I think if it had stayed with my feet on the ground, uh, what, what a lot of players do now, uh, where you, you know, you, you're trying to mimic that contact. Uh, I think I could have hurt myself or I could have hurt him. So I did jump over him and sort of lost my balance. And I was just basically saying that, you know, he hasn't touched me. So, you know, I'm saying, well, it's obviously not a penalty. Um, I don't think Roy Evans, who was the manager, was very happy with me at the time. <laughs> uh, but, uh, yeah, I was just basically saying it wasn't a penalty. penalty and, um, I mean, a, a few good things did come out of it, in all honesty, Chris. I actually got a, a, a fair play um, certificate yeah. from um, from UEFA, which is a prouder place in uh, in in my house, and uh, the other one was uh, Jason McAtee got a, a, an advert for, for well for a for an air product. I, don't, I think it was. I think it was Wash and Go. I'm not sure yeah. what it was, but he scored his actually first Liverpool goal from uh, from me missed a penalty from the rebound. So I think he was happy with me. And <laughs> uh, what I will say as well is, and I know you're going to say it now, did I miss on purpose? Not a chance, by the way. And the you referee give it. Uh, and look, who am I to argue with referees? He's given a penalty. I think we have to abide by that, Chris, don't we? Yeah, well, fair enough. You did that. And, and of course, Seaman did save it. So you didn't miss the penalty on purpose. You can categorically say that. Ah, not a chance. No, no. I go on the football pitch every single time and I, I want to win. So, you know, and I know there's a, there's an element of uh, maybe cheatiness. Is that even a word? Is it cheatiness? Well, well, it's it is not, now, isn't it? It, it is, is, it is, it is, it is now. now. So there's an element of cheatiness uh, creeping into the game and uh, I don't think you, you can win games by that. And um, yeah, and uh, yeah, I, I wanted, when the referee gave the penalty, uh, of course, I, I wanted to take it, I wanted to score, but it was just a rubbish penalty. It really was. <laughs> well, they're, all, the they're, 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 they're all rubbish when you miss, aren't they? They, they, they certainly are. And now I've got that shirt. Uh, and for those on the podcast, I am holding up that 1996-1997 Liverpool away shirt. This courtesy, incidentally, of LFC Retail right here in the UAE. So big thanks to Craig and his team for supplying this. Now, Robbie will be signing this. We will be giving this away at the end uh, of the podcast. And of course, a chance for you to win that. Nice piece of kit, this, Robin. That's one lot. memory. Yeah, you know, you know that kit? I, th I think they are very, very hard to get hold of, you know, really are. I think they're like, um, I mean, they are a proper collector's item, then. I've got and, one, and you're going to sign it. Uh, for well, one Alice, of our... I know you've got one because you are a closet Liverpool fan. That is uh, a you, look, load of you, you keep, you, look, you keep shaking your head, Chris, but you are. You're definitely a closet one. I don't care what you say. You load this fella in Scotland. Do you, you, you probably went in there. And you had a Liverpool top underneath your Man United cardigan or whatever you wore. I'm telling you. I don't, <laughs> Man United oh, cardigan? No, oh. I'm not 85, Rob. Cardigans well, yeah. were not worn in northeast of Scotland when I was a wee nipper, that's for well, sure. Well, it was cold up there, wasn't it? So you it might, was. You, you uh, might have had. Uh, and, and that's another thing. So just a, a, another quick question on that kick, Chris. What, uh, yeah. I bet you can't name the colour. Can you? Oh, cheaper cream. No, it's not. Uh, babe, it'd be... babe. There is this color of this shirt. Are you, have you got a fancy name for this? Have you? Yeah, well, yeah, well, I haven't. Too. I mean, the, uh, the 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 maker actually brought out the, uh, the the kit, and it was a color. It was actually called Ecru. I'd never heard of it before. That came out in all fairness. That's a great quiz question. The colour Ecru. Never heard of him in my life. Probably because I didn't, never paid too much attention. It is, well, to be well, fair, well, though. Well, well, uh, we, we know that's false. That's what a false claim by yourself there. It's a, it's a decent, it is a decent shirt. You could win it, uh, again, by just viewing and listening to this podcast. So one myth then, you've put it to bed. You didn't miss that penalty on purpose. The other big one, Rob, and again, it's a conversation we've had numerous times before. The Everton goal celebration, it, it's probably the, the biggest... I guess one of the biggest kind of controversies surrounding yourself, the, the celebration against Everton, I think back in 1999, Anfield 3-2 was the final score. You scored a penalty, and then it's pretty well documented how you celebrated. The backstory to that, please, and, and be honest with us. Yeah, well, the, the backstory was obviously because I, I was out in Liverpool, and you know people were were putting stories about me, uh, you know, going out and doing uh, recreational drugs, uh, shall we say. Uh, and it was probably a, a moment in my life where, I mean, I'm obviously never really too bothered what people think about me, but that was a tough time for me because everywhere I went, I was getting stick and I was getting accused of everything and 
Uh, I had people writing on my wall outside my house that I was a, you know, I was a smackhead, I was a drug taker, I was this and I was that, and, and it used to affect me. So I always believed it was the Everton fans, you know, where it came from. And uh, look, regardless of what people think about me, as I said before, you know, I think the fact is I don't always well against Everton and. Uh, you know, Everton fans disliked me. Not all of them, admittedly, but you know, the majority did because I'd, I'd scored against Everton. But maybe because I grew up an Everton fan and they didn't like that fact. But I just felt every time I went out or every time I was walking through town, you know, I, I would I would get someone giving me stick over over drugs, uh, and I'm very very anti drugs to be honest, and it, and it affected me. You know, I've had problems within my family with drugs, and you know, people sort of know the. You know the depths of what uh, what my family has gone through, then you know you you think twice about you know labelling or you know target me with that, and it, it affected me. I mean, you can imagine yourself. Imagine you waking up one morning and you've got people, you know, out, well not people outside my house, but people uh, I'd been outside graffiti. my house and, yeah. and and graffiti on the wall, and I mean it was it, it was just incredible, and I went, oh my god, I, I, this this needs to stop. So I I didn't know how to stop it, and. I always said to myself, well, next time I play against Everton and if I score, I'm just going to get on my hands and knees and, and mimic doing what you are saying I'm going to do. Well, I'm user mimicking, oh, so I'm going to mimic what you are saying I'm doing. Uh, and, I mean, the first game I actually did score a penalty and I, I knew straight away what I was doing. Uh, I was always going to do it. It was planned, it was premeditated and it was just a little bit of a, a, little bit of a kick in the backside to all the Everton fans. I think the... Uh, I think certainly the Anfield Road end was was full of Everton fans, and I think a lot of them did laugh. To be fair, a lot of them did uh, did 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 know what it was all about. But then obviously you get all the uh, the ones who were offended by everything, um, who who just didn't like what I was uh, what I was doing. So uh, they complained, and uh, and it, again we go back to the Gerard Hule, uh obviously incident as well. Gerard Hule came out after the game and. His support for me then was just unbelievable. Uh, it was massive and, and something that I massively, massively appreci appreciated because of the amount of stick I was taking. Uh, and he um, he just came out and said, oh, he was just you know practicing eating the grass like what Rigobert Song does in, in Cameroon. And I actually felt sorry for Gerard for coming out and saying that because I think every man and his dog knew exactly what I was doing. But Gerard, being Gerard, wanted to come out and support his team and, and you know, stuck up for me so much uh, and I actually went oh my god I can't believe he's actually believing that and uh, yeah so it was just a case of I had loads and loads of sticks so it was just me of uh, maybe a way of getting my uh, my own back um, so, uh, I, but I, always, I know what you can say Chris but it's always a case of look people always say do I regret it I regret I regret all the things afterwards because people think people don't really know the story People don't really know the story of why I did it, and people think, "Are oh, you doing it because you're you like that type of thing?" So I regret that, uh, but I don't regret doing it for the ones who knew why I was doing it. If that, does that make sense? Absolutely, it does. Yeah, absolutely, it does. And and and, and aside here, Rob, because I was obviously doing research of the incident, and it was the biggest fine at the time. It was the biggest fine that the FA had handed out to any player. Do you remember how much it was? Uh, Sixty. Jeepers. Did the wife talk to you for a few days or she, she would have given you the silent treatment for a few days after that, right? Yeah. That, that's no, that was noble. That was noble. That, <laughs> that, that, yeah, hey, that was noble. G g give us insight on that, Rob. I've always wondered, see when you pay a fine to the FA, how does it work? Does, do, does the club, does it come straight out of the pay packet or have you got a wire transfer <laughs> that yeah, money no, yeah, over well, to... Yeah, no, I, no, it's just straight out of my wages, yeah. So, yeah. It's obviously, um, yeah, it was straight out of your pay packet, so... Yeah, it's and it's not an nice incident that... No, it's not. not. And, and not as you've nice. got older, you, you've stuck to that, that you regret it for the reasons why, the, the, the stigma perhaps, but you certainly don't regret it for those that knew exactly what that was, a repost yeah, yeah. to the stick that you were getting. Yeah, that's I, fair and, enough. And I, that's probably the unfortunate thing, is that you know, people don't really understand why I did it, or there's lots and lots of people who don't understand why I did it, and... Uh, I know it's, there's a little bit of seriousness uh, involved in this, but uh, I just felt it was it was justified and why I need to do it. It's just a case of look, I'm doing this to you because you have wound me up, so I'm winding you up back. And people don't people don't understand what happened before, and people don't know what I went through. People don't understand you know me walking through you know Liverpool city centre, you know getting absolutely mullered, uh, you know in bars, nightclubs, the amount of stick. 
I was taking, you know, people writing on the walls, uh, you know, to my house, people writing on the car. Uh, I mean, it was just quite incredible. Um, and yeah, it was just, it was just not a nice, not a nice period of my life, you know, where having to, uh, to explain it all the time. Yeah, fair enough on that front, Rob. So that's two stories that I think are well documented. People will be aware of those. The other big one, Rob, and I've laughed about this with you in the past as well, that you are, whenever your name pops up, obviously God and Liverpool legend, and you went on to play for Man City and Leeds and Blackburn as well. The other big thing about Robbie Fowler is that he owns about 10,000 properties. <laughs> in the UK, that you are this property magnate, that no one has more properties in the UK than Mr. Robbie Fowler. Is that true? Uh, well, I wish it was. I mean, look, <laughs> I, I did obviously play football, yeah, of course, I invested in them and I, I did have a few, but I, I'm not sure where the uh, where the stories come from about all the, the amounts or... But it got to, again, it, it's getting to the point where, you know, the more you say stuff and, you know, people bring it, all, bring it up all the time and if you're trying to rectify it and trying to right all the wrongs all the time, people sometimes don't even listen. So in the end, you just go, I just, just let them be. And so I've, I've had a few. I mean, but absolutely nowhere near that number. That is just incredible. I, I, I mean, I wish I did, in all fairness. I wish I did. But uh, yeah, so it's uh, obviously what, when, when I was playing football, it was just something that I, had, I did get into in terms of my, um, my financial advisor just recommended. And, yeah, I went down the route and it was, in all fairness, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't really claim credit because my, my wife, she done a, she done a lot of the work as well. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm obviously so, jump, jumping onto her bandwagon <laughs> and hanging onto her coattails here. So she was... So, uh, uh, you had no football, you had none, none of your teammates knocking on your door asking for property advice then? What one? Eh, I'm saying <laughs> no, yeah, you, 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 you had a lot, did you? Yeah, no, that went over your head, that Chris, didn't it? It, and it I, did, I, uh, it did. Uh, I did. I, I had a few, but not not as many as what people think. In all fairness, so. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, funny enough, I do still get um, people ask me all the time, and yeah, I, I would advise them. I've obviously got friends who are certainly into the property game. Uh, I'm involved with a, a, a few companies as a, as an ambassador, as well. So yeah, pe people do sort of associate me uh, with obviously property. But uh, again, I mean, what I will say, I, I love football. So I mean, all my all my energy and all my my love went into the game uh, and obviously this is uh, hence why I'm, I'm doing what I do now because obviously yeah. culture and managing is for me is, is the big thing you know it's, it's not it's not bricks and mortar it's it's footballs and players and it is and I think anyone listening to this might actually be somewhat surprised that you know you have been I know a manager over in Malaysia we've talked about as well your stint down in Brisbane with the role well, I'll have to stop you there Chris it's Thailand Malaysia. was it Thailand Thailand Thailand, Thailand. my apologies yeah. Thailand somewhere over in that part of the world. Yeah. Thailand, you yeah. were for a spell. Then Brisbane, of course, Brisbane Roar. And you were doing well, back-to-back -back Manager of the Month awards before the pandemic hit. Now in India, but your aspirations, Rob, you want to be a manager back home one day, right? I, I want to be the very best I can be. Uh, and look, wherever that takes me, that it takes me there it is. So I think ideally you, you, you always believe that you should be in the Premier League. Uh, but look, I'm savvy enough and clever enough to know that you know I'm, I'm want to do the best job I can and wh wherever that takes me um, you know we'll, we'll see so you know I have got aspirations of course you have you know I've got ambitions uh, and I want to be the best you know I'm learning all the time uh, like I was when I was a player you know I, I was ambitious I wanted to get better all the time and that's exactly the same as what I am as a manager you know I've, I have a good team around me which I think is massively important and uh, you know, I, I'm I'm on the right track to where I believe I, I you know I, I want to be. Well, listen, we're going to keep a very close eye on what you're doing over in India, East Bengal, boss. And listen, I know there's a, a number of men you've already ta talked about, Gerard. And listen, just find, final one on him, and that comes to perhaps our next guest in episode two of the new Robbie Fowler podcast. Is Gerard the best manager you played under? Um, I mean, look, he, he's certainly up there. I I, I think my I mean, it's 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 a it's an horrible question, Chris. To be fair, because I've just said all the good things about Gerard and you know how, what he is as a man, but he, he wasn't my, my best manager because I never, I never played that much under him. Um, yeah. Again, that might have been my fault. Uh, you know, in fact, it probably was my fault. To be fair, for not for not adhering to what he was trying to get at the best out of me. 
but I probably played my best football under Roy Evans. Uh, I mean, I've got a love for a lot of love for every manager I've played under. Uh, I mean, I go back as far as Graham Souness making my debut. You massively appreciate what he did for me, uh, giving me that chance. Uh, Roy Evans was was instrumental in a lot of the goodness that I brought, uh, scoring goals, playing games. Uh, you know, and, and I felt probably more comfortable playing it because I was I was a regular. Um, but with obviously with with Gerard and, and with Rafa Benitez. I mean, technically and tactically, they are absolutely magnificent, really are. So Rafa was technically and tactically brilliant. Gerard was technically and tactically brilliant. Maybe lacked a little bit in terms of man management, which is what Roy Evans had in abundance. Uh, and now, obviously, brings me full circle to, uh, you know, hopefully the uh, the next guest is a uh, is a man that w- would love to see on. Uh, obviously, yeah. here now is uh, is, is Jurgen, and I think he ticks every single box um, as as a man manager. I think he's incredible. And as a you know technical and tactical manager, I think he's incredible as well. So um, I think the modern the modern football manager needs to tick all these boxes. And I think that's what uh, what we have with Jurgen. Yeah, you are a fanboy, a self-confessed fanboy of Jurgen, and no wonder because the job he's done. I mean, I said at the top of the show, thirty years, Robbie, thirty years, Liverpool waited for a league title. And Jurgen got the job done, and he will hopefully. But you, but you know what, Chris? Uh, look, yeah. You know, we, we don't talk about the past, do we? I mean, that's what all you that's what you all you Man United fans used to say to us all the time. So we yeah, we don't need to talk about the past. <laughs> that's fair. That's fair. Yeah, we will get over <laughs> the line. It, it is. It is Liverpool Man United, of course. Uh, next Sunday. I'm actually United. quite proud. I'm actually quite proud of myself for just giving you that little statement there, Chris. Because it's fine. Yeah. It's fine, Rob. I will take I, I mean, it. Are you, are you open to get have some back straight away? And look, even forget about the result next week. Hey, forget about the result. It doesn't matter, does it? Because you'll probably just end up talking about the past you've done again, isn't it? Well, no, if we win next week at Anfield, we'll be talking about the win at Anfield. It's just I don't think United will go to Anfield and win. And that's despite the fact you've got no Virgil van Dijk, no Joe Gomez, Thiago Alcantara is coming back fit. But, you know, listen, you're, you're happy with the team and, and where Liverpool are trending, right? Despite the injuries, you still make yourselves favourites for Sunday. And I guess you probably still make yourselves favourites for this title, right? I think so. Um, and look, it's not me being getting too carried away or too excited about Liverpool I think Liverpool certainly under Jürgen um, the last four or five years have been incredible I think every year they've progressed okay this year is maybe a little bit of a bit of a stumbling block in terms of results and performances uh, but you know you, you've mentioned a, a few major players or main players uh, if you like not, pl- not played and look everyone everyone will be in the same boat in terms of you know missing players uh, we all do that and it's pointless moan about it. You've still got to go out there. You've still got to get the results. Uh, you've still got to do what's needed. Uh, and look, the good thing about Liverpool now is, I mean, they're not firing all cylinders, uh, and and they're still close to be where where they need to be, which is uh, at that you know the, the top of a uh, top top of that table. And that that's the big all the be all and end all, isn't it? You want to finish the table, so it doesn't matter how you get there. You know, it doesn't matter how you play. Uh, all that matters the results and um, you know being at that top of the table and uh, Liverpool are are steadily uh, you know chipping away without playing unbelievable and, and they're still top so I think that puts them in good in a good place in all fairness because you know there's, there's lots of teams behind who are playing well getting good results i.e. Man United are um, I mean they are on the coattails I know they're, they're above us in the league in terms of what they are now but uh, they're hanging over the coattails. Uh, I mean, they're playing really well at the minute, but you know Liverpool aren't, and, and Liverpool are still there or there about thereabouts. Yeah. And I think Liverpool will change. Something will change, and they'll, they'll start you know, pulling away from uh, teams again. I really do believe that. But I know you might like this, Chris, as well. But two the ones, Man City. I think Man City yeah. class as well. Man City are brilliant, and we we've had, had many a chat over the years, haven't we, about so how good they are and how good they can be. But what I, I do like about them this year is uh, like the very very sturdy. Whereas you think of Man City teams in the past, and it was all about the flair and the flamboyancy in the final third and how many goals he scored. And it was always a case of uh, defensively they're not they're, they're not much or teams can be get at. I know it's a, obviously a little bit of a, an absurd question because obviously the amount of goals he scored and you, you've actually got to get the ball off those players. But uh, but now they look rock solid at the back. And mm-hmm. I, I'm not sure whether it, it might have uh, it might have even been fair. You said this, Sir Alex, who said uh, you know, great players can win your games, but defenses win your titles. And uh, I mean, City are probably 
I'd put, I would them, agree. As, I'd put them as favourites ahead of Liverpool in all fairness, but just because of the way Liverpool are playing. But um, towards the end of the season, we'll peak, Chris. Don't you worry, we'll peak. Uh, yeah, it has got me worried, Rob. That's the problem. I am a worried boy ahead of the, the finale to what is shaping up to be an incredible season. I'm conscious of time, Rob. Uh, episode one, the Robbie Fowler podcast, brought to you by McDonald's McCafe. That is great tasting coffee, simple. It's been great to have this little natter, Rob. We've been promising to do this as I say, for many moons. We've finally got here. We got the technical gremlins to one side. And listen, the first podcast in the bag, my friend. Well done, you. Uh, Well done, you. Well done, you. I'm looking forward to rolling out this Robbie Fowler podcast, Series 1. We're going to be joined by a number of Robbie's good friends. Your contact book, thankfully, is bigger than mine, Rob. That's the only thing that's bigger than Uh, mine. uh, uh, (laughs) Uh, To be fair, you are quite tall. (laughs) <laughs> I was talking about the bank balance, Robert. I don't get paid all that much. You've got properties. You've got millions of properties yeah, back in the long. UK. Yeah. You know? But we've got great <laughs> guests. We've got great guests coming up over the course of the next few weeks. Do download the Robbie Fowler podcast. Please do that. Subscribe to it. Give us a rating as well. Robbie's the star of the show. I'm merely here to uh, make him look good. At least that's what I've been told in my contract. But Rob, bless you, my man. (laughs) Love doing this. Episode one is in the bag. And uh, quick prediction for Sunday then, Liverpool against Man United. It's a Marcus Rashford hat-trick, is it not? Uh, Oh, no, what an horrible question that is. Uh, Look, uh, my prediction... Yeah, my prediction is just a Liverpool win. And I actually don't care what score, because Liverpool Liverpool are winning the game. Confident. That's a that's a confident Liverpool win. Look at that. The fact is that the fact is that you're a man, you and you're like, yeah, I think, I think you'll win. I'm a pessimist, though. Yeah, but you know, to be fair, if you if you turn round to me and said, I think we'll win, I'll go, yeah, you're right, Chris. I think we will win because you are a Liverpool fan. I'm not a Liverpool fan. Let's get that straight. Hey, by the time, hey, by the time these podcasts finish, you will be a Liverpool (laughs) fan, and everyone (laughs) in Dubai and all over the world will know you are a Liverpool fan. I will give you, (laughs) I will give you a quiz on all of this after this podcast finish, and I tell you what. I promise everyone watching and listening to this, because I'm going to get hammered back home by this, Rob. I am not a Liverpool fan. So, so so you know the, um, so. So then the next podcast we do, right? So this yeah. is obviously after the Liverpool Man United game. Now I can't Correct. do it because obviously because I'm associated with the club. Now you're just a supporter. Now, if Liverpool win, I think you <laughs> no should chance. come on the podcast wearing the Liverpool shirt. <laughs> no chance. And if Man United win, you do likewise, right? I can't get older one. Come on, I can send you one. I've got a week to send you over to India. I'll Amazon it. Free plug for Amazon on this podcast. But I'll but send you. Know, I, you. I, you know, I'm going I'm to stop you right there as well. You know why? Because I've been waiting for football boots to come through <laughs> and they've been in customs for over a month. So I'm not sure whether they'll get it, that the shirt will get it in time, Chris. Uh, hey, but I, listen, I know people. You, you, you can easily pick up a Liverpool shirt in, um, in Dubai. I've got one. It's going to be signed by you. That is a deal. If Liverpool win, I will maybe wear a Liverpool badge. If Man United win, then I promise you, you've got to wear that Man United kit <laughs> next next pod. <laughs> yeah, right, well, uh, that's it. Yeah. Done. No, that's that's a no, deal, you, you've got to wear. No, you've got to wear the kit. Not you can't wear a Liverpool badge. You've got to wear a top. If so you, a top. You want, yeah, a Liverpool top. No, a Liverpool top. So you know. In fact, why don't you wear the top that we won the league in? Nah, I'm that'll not doing be, that. Be, hey, with, hey, with that Premier League gold badge on the side as well. Watch this space. We've maybe got a deal there. Do tune in to episode two. Very special guest. Robbie's hinted at it for episode two. That is in the works. We're looking forward to having you back here. But as I say, do subscribe. Do download the pod, uh, poddy. Do give us a rating as well. And we'll be back. Episode one is in very much in the can. Robbie Fowler, busy man. Go and watch some tactical uh, opposition shaping nonsense. Get that done because you're <laughs> unbeaten in four. We want to make it five before we spot, speak again. I'll I'll try, mate, I'll try. Good stuff. Robbie Fowler, the Robbie Fowler podcast. We will be back with episode two. Make sure to download every single Monday. It is in association with McDonald's here in the UAE. I'll say ta to you, Rob. We'll catch up next week. See you soon, pal.